Yes. Thank you. I'm honoured to be invited to speak today. I'm honoured to follow Guruji Krishna's speech. And I'll actually be picking up on some themes that were touched on, particularly talking about prana. I am regularly asking myself, what is yoga? I think probably we all ask ourselves that regularly. I think it's a healthy question to ask. Certainly as we've seen yoga move from India throughout the world, and we have very many different types of yoga, different words describing yoga. It's a big subject. We can have the actual Sanskrit definition of to, to yoke, to join, but then yoga does so much. It, it is an exercise system, I would say. You can do yoga and exercise and get a healthy body. It's also can be used for stress reduction, so it's a stress management system. It can be used for the mind. It can be used for self-development, personal transformation, all of those things and more. So, recently I had an experience last year when I was in India spending some time with my teacher so I've been travelling to Mysore, which is in the south of India, as of course many of you know, where the Ashtanga Yoga Institute is since 2005. And I go there regularly to study. And the last couple of years I've had the good uh, fortune of also joining my teacher on some yatras in different parts of India. And last year we, uh, we went to Rishikesh and we were hosted by Paramah Nikitan, the wonderful ashram right there on the banks of the Ganges in Rishikesh. We were lucky to do our, our morning practice there and followed by a, a satsang by Sharat Joyce, who is the current lineage holder for the Shanga Vinyasa system. And so we finished the practice and he gave a very simple speech. Uh, but it was a, it, it, it made me, it, it was just something that he said that I wanted to talk further about today. It's very simple. But he said, what we're doing with this yoga, with, these, with this physical practice of yoga, of course we were doing physical postures. So what is it that makes these physical movements yoga as opposed to exercise or one of the other things? And what he said was that when we're practicing yoga from these movements, we're generating prana. That's what we're doing with this yoga practice. So Prana, Guruji already just mentioned about this, and I'm sure, of course, all of you are yoga professionals. They don't need to go into in depth. They only have 20 minutes about what Prana is, but it's obviously, if you translate it, Prana is a Sanskrit word. In other Eastern modalities, it's, it could be used the word ki or chi, or if I'm speaking in English, life force energy. So prana, as all of us know, well, I'll just mention it again, we can get prana from the sun, we can get prana from wholesome food, prana comes from spending time in, in nature, or prana comes from yogi practices. So we have, all of us are engaged in different forms of yogi practices, we all come probably from different lineages, and that's the wonderful thing about a conference like today is to bring everyone together to share. So we've got many different paths. But the commonality is, is that if we're engaging in effective yogic practices, in a sense we're developing a, a, our yogic superpower. Our yogic superpower is we're able to cultivate prana within us from our yogic practices. I'm going to talk specifically about the tradition that I'm trained in and one of the methods that is used for the, for the generating of, power, of prana because the next thing Sharat said when he gave his speech was that we do the yogic practices, we do this practice to generate prana and that is done through vinyasa. So, vinyasa, it's an interesting word. 
when I meet people, I meet, I meet people new to yoga all the time, and I'm explaining to them what yoga is or what the different types, and of course there's so much confusion because there's so many different words attached in front of yoga. Iyengar yoga, Shanga yoga, Hatha yoga, Hatha vinyasa, vinyasa flow. And it's interesting that in the, certainly in the West these days, most people have heard the word vinyasa probably over and above the word ashtanga. So we had the good, nice explanation of obviously ashtanga yoga is the eight limb path set out by Patanjali in the Yoga Sutras. The system that I practice is called ashtanga yoga that was termed that by Krishnamacharya and Patavi Joyce in the um, early of the century. And it's believed they gave that terminology to, just to explain that the asana system that we're doing should always be done within that context of the eight limbs. It should never be done independently, but it is part of that eight limb. And also within the physical practice that that we do in the Ishtanga Vinyasa system, those eight limbs can be found. We can find Ahimsa, we can find Tapas, we can find Dharana within the daily morning practice, in fact. The, the, the eight limbs are all contained in that practice. But back to Vinyasa. So I would say in the West now, almost this word has become like a cinnamon. Sorry, I have a problem with the N's and the M's, so <laughs> if I have to say phenomenon, we're in big problem. <laughs> so it's all, so the word vinyasa has almost become like uh, exchangeable with flow. You agree with me? People have this, and you even have classes called vinyasa flow. So let's talk about a little bit then about the origin of that word vinyasa. And like, uh, many Sanskrit words, and I have not studied Sanskrit, I've only studied it within the context of my yoga studies, so I'm not an expert on Sanskrit. But from what I understand, Sanskrit is quite complex and there can be different meanings attached to the one word. And the word vinyasa can refer to a few different things, and I'm going to refer to what it means specifically within the tradition handed down from Krishna Mancharya to Patapi Joyce that is now taught in Mysore. So firstly, who is Krishna Mancharya? So if you follow any lineage that comes from the south of India, yes? yes I come from Krishna Right, so then you know who Krishna Mancharya is. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> So I would say now um, he is considered probably, you would say, the grandfather of what people are referring to as modern postural yoga. So if you go into a yoga studio, certainly in, in the West, even here in Dubai, then many of the sequences and um, tradition, the, the asana practices that have been taught have a derivative from Krishnamacharya and that was particularly through his main disciples that he had at different stages within his life. BKS Iyengar, Patabi Joyce, Ramaswamy and there's a few, a few others as well, Indra Devi who's not as well known. So Krishnamacharya is a fascinating man because he took what was considered quite esoteric practices and started teaching them to householders. So he had actually mastered the six philosophical schools of thought in India. He studied in Varanasi. But he had a desire to experience what he had studied. Because of course, these are philosophies, things that he had read in books, but he wanted to experience these concepts. And that's what yoga is. It's the giving you a set of practices to experience the things that are talked about in philosophical schools of thought. And to do that, he needed to leave Varanasi and tra he traveled, it, but it's believed somewhere near Mount Kailash where he found his guru, who he stayed with for seven years, Raman Mohan Brahmachari. And it is believed that at the end of that time, of course, like all end of guru disciple relationships, he didn't want to leave, he wanted to stay with his guru. But his guru urged him to go back down the mountain 
into back into regular life and to teach what he had been taught to regular people, to householders. This is a big difference, as many of you know if you've studied, studied the history of yoga practices within India, of course, it was a free things that were done on the fringe. Yogis were considered often dropouts from society, not people within the living regular lives. So he started teaching this and he was very lucky to come, come under the patronage of the Maharaja of Mysore. And what he was teaching actually was quite therapeutic physically and helped cure some of the Maharaja's diseases. And so he was, the Maharaja became his patron. And so Krishna Macharya, it's quite nice. Maybe it's like being a, a, spo being a sponsored yoga teacher. <laughs> I'd quite like, I'd like a patron. <laughs> but he was able to then teach and open a school in, in Mysore. So what he was teaching, and it is believed what he had learned from the guru, that was transmitted to him orally, was a text called the Yoga Kurunta, and he was that was transmitted to him orally. It's believed a copy of that Yoga Kurunta is, was kept in the Calcutta Library, but unfortunately it was written on palm leaves, and like many of those ancient texts, written on the palm leaves, nature, and so that text is no longer there. So the contents of that was the idea of vinyasa. And vinyasa in this context is not meaning flow, it's meaning the order of things, and this is where the word was sometimes used in reference to ritual, so it's a specific order of how things should be done within a ritual. But put into the context of what Krishnamacharya was teaching, it was the order of certain asanas, and the linking of breath with movement. And it, it's that aspect that Patavi Joyce then developed further, and he helped then categorize the different asanas into different sequences, but the basis of the, the uh, system that they developed was the linking of breath with movement. And it is this linking of breath and movement within the Ashtanga Vinyasa system that is considered to be what generates prana. And in fact, Krishnacharya is quoted in a book that he wrote in the 1930s that actually was only translated into uh, English maybe 10 years ago. I was actually in Mysore when it was translated and released. It's called the Mark Yoga Makaranda. And of course, you know, within the Hatha Yoga tradition, there's still so many gaps of knowledge because it was an oral, it's an oral history, it was an oral transmission. So many of these things were coming down from guru to disciple to guru to disciple. And as Westerners, we're always looking for evidence of things. And this is where like yoga is meeting up with science. We want things, we want proof, we want things written down. A lot of these texts simply don't exist anymore. So in my mind, the only way to have proof is to have experience, to experience it yourself. So I'm actually standing here today saying, this is what my teacher has told me. He has told me these yoga practices generate prana. But I'm not going to just stand there and say that because somebody told me. I'm standing and saying it because I've experienced it for myself. And that's why I practice Ashtanga Yoga. And I'm not saying that this, my, the system that I'm practicing is the only system. Uh, actually, in fact, any, all yoga practices, when they are done effectively, and you as yoga practitioners will know, and that's why you're here, because you feel that prana. You've experienced it. And you can see it in somebody else. You can see when somebody is a yogi. Their eyes are shining. Are shining. Recently, I had a wonderful visiting teacher um, he teaches within the Iyengar discipline. His wife was a little bit older than me. Her skin just glowed. Now, maybe it might be she does regular castor oil baths. <laughs> I should do them more regularly. Her skin glowed, her eyes were bright, her commitment to her daily physical practice. And this is where you know, sometimes we can be dismissive of 
physical yoga practices. Oh, it's, it's just physical. But as Hatha yogis, we know there is, because you've experienced it, there is a connection between the body and mind. There is. That, that's, what, that's what the rishis had figured out thousands of years ago. That's why these practices have been handed down. We use the body as a gateway to the mind, and what is the link? It's the breath. So this vinyasa system is very powerful. I never, I still don't really understand. I still just call it magic. It's something magical about this link of the breath and the movement, and then the final component is, of course, the concentration of the mind that comes. So which is why within, our, within your morning practice you can experience asana, you can experience pranayama, you can experience pratihara, the draw of the senses, you can experience the dharana, the concentration that comes, and finally the dhyana, the inner meditative absorption. So why prana? Why is it important? Why? Because it's like our superpower. It's our yogi superpower. And in fact, this is um, the husband of the woman I just mentioned, the one with the glowing skin. He, again, sometimes people tell you these things, it can be just something so simple, but it just sticks in your mind. And he just said, we have to do this yoga because we all need that extra energy. We need this extra prana. Because often we're not getting it from the food necessarily. We may, in Dubai, I'm hardly even in the sun. It's too strong. And when we don't get, as city dwellers, we don't get, we're not spending time in nature like probably the, the rishis of ancient days were. But we have yoga. We have a yoga, yoga practices that we can do. We can do it every day. And that's like our little, I, I even consider now like a, the, the ability to cultivate prana is like a city. You know, we read about uh, cities that come to yogis. So this is our, our city, you know, the, and we need it. You know, our lives are very stressful. Family, work, driving. Jen, I don't have to explain to you. <laughs> so we need every little bit of help we can get. So if we can find yoga practices, whether it's the system I follow, is the Shanda Vinyasa system. Of course, all of you have your own practices. And what bonds us together, even though that we're coming from different aspects, is that we're all able to use these practices to develop and cultivate life energy. Okay, so why do we need the life energy, just, uh, not just for helping us survive? I want to do more than survive. I need this life energy to fulfill my dharma. <coughs> That's my purpose. My life purpose I, is to find what my dharma is and have the vitality, the vibrance, the energy, the equanimous mind to be able to fulfill it. So following on from the, the talk before about using yoga for social integration, we're using yoga to be obviously the best that we can be and contribute to that greater good. And if we can harness these very powerful yogic practices and remember that, that that's what we're doing with these practices. And while somebody might say, look at the practice and say, oh, that looks very physical. No one really knows except for you what is actually happening in that practice, where your mind is, where your breath is, and ultimately, how you feel afterwards. Students often say to me, how do you think I'm going in my yoga practice? Do you think I'm improving? And of course, I could comment on like, oh yeah, I mean, now you can touch your toes, and now your breath seems more steady. Um, you know, but there's many, many variables that I could gauge in terms of what improvement is. But I, I actually always say, how, how do you feel? How does the yoga, how is it making you feel? And if they say, oh, I've got more energy, I used to you know, yell at my husband and now I don't, <laughs> then I said, then the yoga's working. So thank you for your time.
time today. I don't know about the timing, but I'm ready to wrap up. Uh, a few more minutes. A few more, a few more minutes. Three minutes more. Sorry? Three minutes more. Oh, three minutes more. Okay, I think it's fine. So thank you, everyone, and keep practicing. Mm -hmm.